I'm Matt Byron, and this is the Marketing Strategies Podcast, where I speak with interesting and well-respected marketers from high-growth companies. We'll discuss the strategies they've used to generate traffic, acquire new users, and grow their business. I know on day 30, if you are going to renew or churn on day 365. It's a little bit of mind control. You need to reach the leads in a specific time frame. The faster, the better. You know, when something works, don't do more like it, do more with it. If you're selling to a very finite audience, an inbound model is going to be grossly inefficient. This audience has what top questions, and then make sure that you have an answer to each of their questions. We don't hire professional writers to write for the blog. We hire sales operations practitioners. Whoever gets closest to the customer wins. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Marketing Strategies Podcast. Today I'm joined by Lucas Zelezny, who is Director of Organic Performance for ZPG PLC. They own some of the UK's most prominent property websites, including Zoopla, Uswitch, Prime Location and Smart New Homes. Lucas is also a regular speaker at search and digital marketing conferences around the world. I'm extremely excited to talk about acquisition in detail today. So let's dive right in. How are you today, Lucas? Hi, Matt. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, I'm very well. Thank you very much. And yeah, um, that's the first days of spring uh, when we're recording this. So that makes me very happy. <laughs> it makes me very happy as well. I can't wait until it's summer, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So um, I'm interested to learn more about your experience. You know, you've got a CV that starts back in 2000 and it interestingly doesn't stray at any position from SEO and PPC. And for the majority of that time as well, you've been working for companies in the property industry, which is particularly interesting. Uh, please tell me more. I'm interested to learn about uh, your background. So, so I could talk about this a little longer than, than normally because there is lots of uh, that happened in this um, pretty much 15 years. But in a nutshell, you know, I've been always kind of this guy between art and science. And back in the day, I was uh, a lot into music. And then, you know, that was like this, my arty nature. And then this arty nature, I could allocate a little more into something like SEO, which is which is a partly like a science, but partly like art. So yeah. if you if you go to my LinkedIn, for example, you can see that um, I uh, it's been 11 years. I'm in UK. I was born in Poland. And I was even in Poland in 2000, 2007. I was doing some SEOs early days. Uh, I've been a DJ and I had a website. And because I was born in a small town, I wanted to play gigs and they the music I was in, it was drum and bass. And the drum and bass gigs been uh, only in this, this big, big towns, uh, big cities. So I had to build a website. Then I started to understanding how to um, analyze traffic. That was pre-Google Analytics era. And then, you know, um, that started picking up. I started to have bookings. It was so much fun. But obviously, you know, parents won't be paying bills for all your life. So then I had to... <laughs> I had to find something that uh, will combine my passion with my, my my work. And thanks God, I never wanted to do music uh, as my profession because I was always thinking that this is like very arty and so on and so on. So I was like, okay, I have a skill. I, I, I know how to make um, websites uh, getting traffic. That's interesting though, I think, for a DJ to actually spend time doing SEO is, is quite interesting. Usually it would be a uh, promotion of CDs or, or, or you know, getting your, your name about there really, but you, you chose to go the search engine route to promote your business. That's an interesting way to go about it. Yeah, but you see, I was thinking the same way back in the day, like you just said right now, but uh, more I'm in this industry, more uh, I'm less surprised. Uh, back in the day, I was working with another DJ. Very often, some uh, musicians are working with me who are in SEO, painters, poets. So I think this, um, this um, you know, this... Uh, uh, a molecule of art is very often visible inside these people who are working in SEO industry. So back to the main story, I didn't, you know, in 2007, I moved to England and I started working first a small co company uh, near Holborn. Then I moved to Fleetway Travel. Then I moved to Thomson Reuters. Then finally, I was working in the properties for HomeAway that, that currently is, I think, a part of Expedia. 
And then uh, I was um, moving to to, to Uswitch, which uh, is like uh, absolutely fantastic company to work for. And as you may know, we've been acquired by ZPG three years ago. So right now, you know, it's not only price comparison websites, but also a property uh, I'm responsible for. And it's fascinating world. Yeah, because um, I guess the the company you switch and then ZPG, they do a lot of different things. So I've seen one of your presentations uh, while I was doing some research, you saying that actually you do all different types of price comparison, which means that you get to learn about all different industries as well. So in a nutshell, ZPG own Zoopla, and this is um, part of property division. And then you have comparison division, which is Uswitch and Money, Co-UK, uh, and that's our two main branches of uh, what ZPG is currently dealing with. And for a long time, your role is mainly focused around U-Switch, is that right? That's correct. I've been for five years head of SEO for U-Switch. And your current role at the moment, does that cover all acquisition channels for the business? It covers pretty much SEO, but for different brands. So right now I'm responsible for U-Switch and Zoopla. Okay. That's really cool. And you recently moved from the head of role to the director role? That's correct, yes. And what does that change involve? You know, what does moving from the head of you switch to the director of Zoopla, I guess, as a PG? So, so right now, like I said, I'm responsible for you switch and Zoopla and, you know, obviously my team is much bigger and um, we have a fantastic opportunity to exchange information between teams because uh, maybe we will get there later in this uh, conversation today. But uh, the, the, the SEO for each of these websites I mentioned is, is, is very different. So SEO for you switch uh, is different to SEO for Zoopla. And because of that, uh, you know, this exchange of information is really, really cool and critical. I'm interested in that. So when you say the exchange of information, it's really about the, the what you learn in doing the SEO for different businesses, those two different, very different end goals, I guess. You switch that between teams to learn more and upgrade each other's skills as you go along. That's correct. And, you know, I've been very lucky that... I I had a, before, first of all, I was always, always working for client side and I was working for property or listing websites as well as very content driven websites. So where I was in Thomson Reuters, I was working for a brand called Contact Low, uh, which was very highly content driven. And then um, when I was in Home Away, then I was working on the property websites. Then, uh, you know, right now in ZPG, we have uh, Zoopla, which is very much listings and properties. And on the other side, we have U-Switch, um, which is highly content driven. And uh, yeah, the team is uh, right now quite big. So, you know, we have lots of brainstorms, lots of chats every day about different solutions, uh, not only how to achieve things, but how to how to track, um, because we also, you know, uh, doing uh, a lot about analytics, um, uh, the t- traffic tracking, uh, conversion rate, and so on and so on. And we doing we giving lots of support to other part of the business. So other teams, uh, we we acting like you know, like like these people who who can answer on some difficult questions sometimes. And can you tell me then what is different about the websites and how you attack those two websites differently in terms of a, uh, an SEO strategy? So obviously I cannot share all my secrets, but uh, <laughs> that's why that's why you're here. I thought, <laughs> yeah, but um, but obviously you know um, uh, it's all about quality. It's all about quality, and it's all about um, giving people a, a fantastic uh, experience. So if I can say about you switch, then then um, we trying to make sure that people when they're looking for some questions uh, related to, to, to our products, they can find these answers on our websites. And that's why we have uh, in-house uh, copywriters who are highly skilled, they understand the product, they understand the tone of voice, they understand many aspects of uh, how the business is working. That's obviously a bit challenging because you cannot 
outsource the content. You cannot go to someone and say like, you know what, write me 10 articles. And that's very similar to what I experienced when I was working in Thomson Reuters, when we had to write articles about low, and that was pretty much been able to, the only people who've been able to deliver these articles being kind of lawyers who on some point wanted to be a copywriters. Uh, no one else can write about different aspects of law and what's the difference in UK, let's say business law uh, or family law and so on and so on. So I think um, to make sure that the content is uh, written properly, you need to have an expert and, and we are, I'm very lucky to work with people who are experts. From the other side, you have Zoopla, which uh, has listings. So it's more technical SEO. It's more, um, you know, uh, more focus on technical aspects of how website is performing. Again, I don't want to go too deep into this because that will inflate uh, this conversation uh, to a couple of hours. But um, obviously, you know, let me go this way. We are living in very dynamic time in terms of SEO. You may think, well, it's been 15 years. Some people even are saying like SEO that still works. But um, I think uh, 2017 and 2018 have been uh, extremely dynamic. So many different new things uh, appeared, so many different things become important that we as a team who are sitting every day there in office, we not only need to give um, proper answers, but also we need to educate ourselves every day to make sure that we 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 catching all the changes and all the requirements that's dynamically changing. And what factors are you seeing as the most relevant for you at the moment? If there's many factors changing, which ones are really moving the needle for you or which ones are you having to adapt to at the moment? Well, it's difficult to say which I see the most important because this is always an opinion and opinion can be easily challenged. But uh, I can, if you would come to me and say, like, Lucas, what I should uh, take care of, I may... Um, be in better position to answer and i would say first of all you know the load speed uh, that's one of the one of the most important if your website is really relying on content then again i will say this right now and for many listeners that can be an obvious thing but for some listeners that may not be an obvious thing so the content must be absolutely unique. Uh, there is no shortcuts and this content should not be in the tabs or in the hidden divs or some expandables. Try to avoid this as much as you can. Then obviously the content length. I'm always saying it's better to have much more solid pages but less pages so quantity quality not quantity make sure and it's good practice to count the, the the number of words make sure that your landing page that is describing a problem is at least 800 or 1000 or 1500 uh, words so you really dive deep in the problem obviously that must be expertise that must be written it should not be like uh, just written to inflate this article to uh, match 1,500 words. And again, 1,500 words is not like a magic bullet. It's not like 1,600 words is better or 1,400, but make sure that this content is long enough. Make sure that the content is uh, media rich. If you're embedding video, maybe it's worth to write a transcript below the video. When you uploading images, Make sure that that are your images, not uh, a stock photos images. Then take care of these little elements like alt tag keyword in the, the, the in the file name of the image. Follow the recent changes about meta description. Meta description always been around 150 characters. Right now is more more than 300 on desktop and 190 character on uh, mobiles. Then finally, you have the whole range of schema markups that still people rarely are using them. I would say like this is the way to go with schema markups uh, to 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 make Google understand better how your website is structured. That's that's in the nutshell. That's that's in the nutshell. I like the nutshell. It was good. <laughs> it covered quite a lot of points there. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm I'm just trying to make sure that our listeners uh, can easily take this um, conversation we have and make some action point and can implement this in their day to day tasks, day to day work. So I think everything I said right now. It, 
pot- potentially is actionable. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the whole point for, of this, to take away some marketing strategies that you can implement or even at least just test in your own business to see what works. And one thing that you touched on is obviously content for both websites. And, you know, content we've always looked at as answering questions for people that are searching for answers. But now, as you touched on as well, it's more important than ever to make sure that the content is as in-depth as possible. So you're really creating the very best page about that particular topic or the answer for that particular question that you can. Absolutely. I have a friend, actually, you know, and I'll tell you an example. And this is a Polish friend who is um, blogging about, uh, she's um, she's a very pretty girl who is working um, in Brand24, which is a brand tracker, fantastic software. But she's also working on her own blog. And you won't believe this blog is about tractors. Okay. <laughs> You understand, like, um, and all these machines you would use on the food, on farming. She just like this, and she is so much into that that she become an expert. And right now, her blog is not only often visited, but uh, and she got the traffic, but she's also invited to many events and so on and so on. And she found a niche that's been quite abandoned in this uh, online world. And I think this is a great example of someone who is. Um, really an expert in the area. One day I will, I will potentially would like to change a profession. I have my niche as well, and I will share this with you. I'm rarely doing this, but I think that's a good moment. I want to be a beekeeper, and I will learn everything about bees, and then I will create a website, and there will be absolutely everything, expertise, opinions about how to keep bees, and so on and so on. Because that's kind of important for me, because, you know, I'm always worried about why bees are almost, yeah, you know, disappearing from, from many regions. And that's obviously, I guess, an interest, but something that you could write on uh, once you've learned all about it and in an authoritative way that probably isn't as competitive as many other niches, for example. That's another story, yes. So this is what uh, makes me uh, pushing to learn more and more because the niche I am operating is very competitive. Yeah. So uh, let's get back to you, Switch. You have uh, car insurance, you have uh, loans, you have broadband, mobile deals. That's our very, very competitive areas. And now to make our content better than others, we really need to think deep and be a couple of steps ahead of our competitors. So another thing um, that I can mention into this list of actionable points, that would be to make sure that if your website is based on content, then probably you should make um, uh, your website AMP ready so accelerated mobile pages uh, the pages that are opening super fast on the mobile devices and this is probably i would risk to say that that may be a requirement not a suggestion not something that you may you may not implement in a couple of years and what success are you finding with AMP? And in terms of, I guess what I mean is that you that people will open an AMP page, read the article. Are you finding that people are then sticking on the website or moving through to other pages of the website from your AMP pages? So that's the challenge of AMP. People may not stay, but uh, again, it's a double double side coin. Right now, it's still an early stage. If you want to be in the game, you may need to implement this solution in the future. But there are ways to make people stay on the website after AMP, yeah? So making sure that, you know, once they landed on AMP, there is um, something that will make people to go on the next page. And this is very classic uh, approach to content to make sure that the pages per session, which is a metric that everyone can see in Google Analytics. So page per session is growing. And how to achieve this? One of the way, and again, uh, I will be referring to this solutions that can be easily implemented. If anyone is using WordPress, uh, and I believe we will have lots of people right now listening to us and using WordPress, there are some solutions like uh, some plugins that v- really help to increase this uh, with very little efforts. I will give you two names. One is SEO Smart Links, which allowed you to pick up uh, words or phrases in the content and link to another pages, and uh, you keep the consistency. The other one is uh, inline related posts. So that plugin insert 
in the content a uh, little kind of a call to action which is like hey also read here and so on and so on finally most of the businesses is trying to convert so obviously you know there is nothing wrong to have an amp page on the beginning of journey and then attracting people to go further down the journey up to the the conversion through through some call to actions that's absolutely fine that makes no difference if you have amp or non amp so there are ways to keep people um on the website even if using amp and i would say that the businesses probably have a easier or or a, a range of things to make sure that people are staying on the website newspapers uh, the, these big publishers uh, may struggle a little more because yes it's very often like you landing on the article scrolling and then swiping back uh, to google and are you actually optimizing really or trying to get is your ideal entrance page one of your articles or the blog for example or are you really trying to get people to uh, one of the product pages or the comparison pages or the property pages for example where are you really optimizing for where are you ideally trying to get people into the websites well, so there is uh, not one way um, in a property, then obviously we have listing pages and we have property pages and uh, it's a very much a long tail keywords that are um, tracked uh, or, or that are triggered. And then, you know, you have um, plenty of options in the, in the comparison. One of the options you mentioned is like a guide pages. So it's a, like kind of an education answering the questions and making sure that uh, people have an answer and also can learn about your business. Another type of content can be um, some tools, some calculators and so on and so on. And then another content uh, I am type that's uh, blog and news. So if blog and news is very time sensitive content describing some current situation on the market you know apple is releasing new iphone uh, or there are some new tariffs uh, on the broadband uh, then then the guides is pretty much an evergreen content uh, and rarely or or not that often is changed only when some circumstances will make us uh, will force us to, to to change to modify the content so that's are just few examples then obviously you know um i would step back a little from what i'm doing day to day and again i would just try to give an advice to our listeners um you need to remember uh, that there is also uh, google my business that um, the proper configuration of Google My Business may increase tremendously number of clicks to your website, to your homepage, pretty much. And, you know, all these little uh, strategies that help to leverage the traffic. So when you have an evergreen content that is answering on the question and you're ranking high, so automatically in my head, there is this little blink that potentially you may see if that or other keywords related to this content trigger a featured snippet or some people call this answer box so can you secure this answer box spot uh, so this is uh, some people are calling this position zero so you will be above the organic results and then also in the organic results and I guess a lot of what you've said is really ticking boxes. So it's to make sure that you're using all the different tools that Google gives you, particularly of, that are available like AMP and uh, Google My Business and the featured snippets and schema and things. Really, I guess what you're saying is try and take advantage of all these different things to, to give yourself the best chance of being visible and then to stand yourselves against the, the other people that are shown in the search engine results page as well. Absolutely, and Google right now with Google uh, with a Google, new Google Search Console um, made life very, maybe not very easy, but much easier in many aspects. Uh, I think new Google Search Console is a fantastic tool uh, that gives uh, lots of powerful insights, and you know that's another tip. Uh, I'm always trying to to follow this low hanging fruits, or maybe not always, but often low-hanging fruits um, this quick wins so going to search console and looking on what keywords are receiving traffic but are not 
uh, on the first or second position or what pages are receiving traffic um, um, relatively high but could rank higher than going to Google Analytics and checking conversions per URL and trying to answer, hey, can we try to rank a little higher on this page and 100 other pages? Because this is when, when you're scaling up. So w- pick up one page, second, third, but do this like one day and then another one, another day, optimize another three, four, five pages. After a week, you have 20, 30, 40 pages optimized. And then after a month, you have you have 100 that is really game changer for your website. Yeah, little by little, bit by bit, and you'll get there really, I guess, is what you're saying there. Consistency. Consistency, yeah. And what, what, what would you look at to optimize a page? What would be the main factors? I know we've touched on a few, which is the tools that Google gives you, but if you were looking at a page of content, how would you decide which keywords you really want to rank for, I guess? And then how would you optimize the page around that? What are your main tactics or your, the first point of call for you, for you to look at? Uh, I really like this question. I mean, I like all your questions, but this one is one of my favorite because I'm uh, often covering this topic on conferences uh, and there are videos on my website as well. So I have two kind of tactics. Uh, One I call gap and the other one I call snapshot. So gap is pretty much what I said a couple of seconds ago. Take all the keywords from... Search Console, from SEMrush, from Search Metrics, from Systrix, from SpyFu, from any other tool, from HFs, from any other tool you have an access to. And if you have more than one, that's even better because you have wider spectrum of, of what's going on with your website. And then when you have these keywords, try to figure out these keywords which are ranking on position 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, they're already in the top 10, they're already on the first page, but maybe with a little effort here and there, you could push them a little up on position 4, maybe 3, maybe even 2, ideally on position 1. And that can be achieved um, pretty much quickly, you know, improve your content, uh, make your content richer, try to make your website uh, working faster. There is lots of advices. And again, I will be referring to WordPress because I believe that lots of people right now is using WordPress. If not, then go to your developer, have a chat, have a meeting and find out uh, if your CSS is minified, if your JavaScript is minified, if you don't have redirection chains, if you're compressing properly your images, and these little bits and bobs that will really, really change the game. But obviously, it's important to make sure that you're tracking this properly. So make sure that you have constantly access to Google Analytics, that you're using um, properly uh, granular data per URL, um, for example, per URL, per uh, traffic source, so organic and specific URLs, and so on and so on. And that was the snapshot. The the other one is gap. And gap uh, is uh, pretty much finding gaps in content or in any any type of content. It doesn't need to be just the guides. It can be tools. It can be anything else. Between you and your competitors. And ideally, when you're looking on a competitor that is bigger, stronger than you. So there is a SEMrush right now which implemented this uh, so you don't need to use even like an Excel. But um, how it works, it's pretty much like you need to pull keywords from two websites or three websites. When one of these websites is yours, the two others are competitor. And you can say in the SEMrush, hey SEMrush, show me keywords where I am not ranking, but these two other websites are simultaneously ranking in Google CoUK. And if you have too many keywords, then you can narrow this to say, show me keywords that I'm not ranking, but these two other websites are, are ranking in top 10. And then you can export this to Excel and you can even start filtering by URLs or deeper look. And that way you can simply find that, okay, these two guys wrote about something, about a topic that, uh, that uh, I have never thought about. So it's a very interesting exercise, not only for an SEO, but also for a business. You can do this for e-commerce and then you can figure out not only the content you're missing, but you can also figure out that there is a gap in the products you or your your business or a business you're working for is offering. 
and you can go to someone who is responsible for a stock or the business owners and say like, listen, I think that we should really go into this and this area, not only because of SEO, but also because of our business performance. So this two approaches, especially gap, can be very influential, not only for SEO, but also other areas of the business, when snapshot is pretty much easy to implement, you know, day-to-day work. And if our listeners would like to know a bit more, like I said, I have a website, maybe later will be a time I will give a URL. And there are two videos where I'm trying to explain this a little more, a little more deeper. Yeah, if you've, um, I'll put those videos, I'll get those videos off you, Lucas, and we'll we'll put those videos in the show notes. We'll embed those so that people can view those as well. That'd be highly useful. We um, we use Ahrefs and we, uh, it does a similar thing where you can compare different websites and see which they're ranking for that you're not ranking for. It's a great way to actually spot gaps, like you said, in the market and the other things that you're not ranking for that you really should be or could be. Absolutely. And if you give me like 30 seconds, one more that I had really right now in my head was uh, internal search. Wherever you have uh, ability to uh, use internal search or implement internal search uh, on your website, that's also very important. Make sure that you're tracking this properly in your Google Analytics and then take a look what people are typing when they finally land on your website, because that's also that data have a tremendous value. That's great. Like, say, for example, we've got a piece of content and we feel like we should be ranking for a particular keyword, but actually we're ranking in, say, position seven. And we feel like actually the piece of content could be ranking higher. How would you actually suggest that people, or what could you suggest that people do to influence that position ranking from seven to, say, the top three? So when you are seven, then probably there is six other websites above you. And I would start probably on looking on their websites what I like about the website that took over me, why potentially they are ranking higher than me. That's a, this exercise uh, can, can teach me a lot, help me understand what these guys are doing and why they are ranking higher. Obviously, there can be other factors like they have more backlinks or their domain are, are, are older or their domain are yeah have higher authority. But generally, I would start from this. And then, obviously, like I said before, first content expansion. Is our content long enough? And if, imagine that if our content is long enough, then we can go into uh, what I call clusterization or building mini apps around some terms. So I will give you an example. If you're thinking about holidays to Egypt, then obviously there is a hub that is called Egypt, and inside there will be Horgada, there will be Cairo, there will be plenty of other destinations that are kind of linked to Egypt, but that are more specific destinations. And pretty much most of the websites are building the structure, the, the architecture of the information that there is like www.example.com slash Egypt slash Hargada or like holidays.com slash Spain slash Barcelona and then slash Madrid. So you're trying to write even more specific content, which will be sitting inside or lower to the to the main page that we was trying to rank. That there may be a bit of cannibalization then that may happen because uh, the URL that was ranking seven may completely disappear and the new content may take over, but. This is the situation when you have pretty long content and you are uh, right now thinking like, okay, what next? Yeah. If your content is not long enough, that's pretty easy. Just write another two, three paragraphs. Try to do some tweaks. Make sure that, you know, maybe the intro of the article already contain some terms you would like to rank. But do this carefully because obviously you don't want to go into anything like keyword stuffing and over and over and over using the same phrase because that definitely uh, won't help. That's not anymore uh, 90s when that's pretty easy techniques were working. Make sure that the page you want to rank is also properly linked from other pages. One of the very easy strategy, if that's very critical page, you really want to rank higher, maybe make sure that this page is linked directly from the 
top menu or the footer menu because then every page across your website will be linking to that one page so when when you go to some flight websites or a holidays website again this example i think is the best very often on the bottom there is lots of links like cheap flights to sweden cheap flights to finland cheap flights to <laughs> yeah. norway and so on and so on and even google is using this is kind of right now a standard even if you go to Google Flights, um, I saw screenshots. I don't know if this is still there, but on the bottom in the footer, there was lots of these links. And obviously some people may think that, uh, well, it's quite controversial, but at the end of the day, lots of people is clicking on these links. So there is an added value. And maybe if that was, um, I, I was reading the debate that maybe if that was back in a day looking a little spammy, then today, because for, for so many years people were using this solution, then right now people are really expecting to see this link in the bottom. And maybe when they don't, they're very often freaking out and they're like, oh my gosh, what, what should I do right now on the website? <laughs> I guess that comes down to user experience as well, doesn't it? If it's not there as well, even though it might be looking a bit spammy or whatever, if it's not there. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And so let's talk about backlinks a little bit. Backlinks, obviously, well, you tell me, do you feel they're still very important in, in SEO? And if so, what is your current take on the strategy to acquire backlinks? Well, I don't think that they are as important as they've been in a couple of years ago. But obviously, you know, they are important. Um, there is no easy way going with it. First of all, backlinks building right now is extremely time consuming and uh, you really need to do this right not to fall into any manual penalty. So I will be always saying stay away from any... Uh, Matt Kutz had this phrase, fly by night, link building, and uh, rather try to make sure that this is done uh, something like a long time perspective i can share a couple of that i'm doing right now for my website so um, i mentioned brand 24 and i have my name and surname which is relatively unique uh, so when i see alerts on brand 24 i know that somewhere i had a mention and then i can go to this website uh, try to contact owner say thank you say that i'm very grateful and then ask if that would be fine if you could put a link to my website. And pretty pretty often they, they are absolutely fine with this. Uh, I don't care that much if this is the do follow, no follow, I'm never specifying this. From the other side, believing that the interesting content will acquire links uh, automatically is a pretty like a um, fairy tale and that doesn't work that this way it's a theory i probably don't have that that this kind of magic bullet for for link building these days i rather because i have this advantage of working for a big brand that makes me in the position that you know these links yes they are coming uh, naturally uh auto they, they are we can see using tools like majestic or hfs that these links are naturally coming uh, to our websites for small brands like I said, try to use something that works for you. And the smaller brands have an advantage that they don't need to follow any this kind of brand code of conduct approaches. Yeah. So for a small brand, it's much easier to contact someone who mentioned that brand and say like, hey, thank you very much. Maybe you can link to me. For big brands, that very often wouldn't look good. So yeah, I know that it's not a perfect answer, but... That's probably the best answer I have at the moment. <laughs> That's cool. And I guess uh, I, I just dip in for the listeners. One of the things that we found most successful over the last few years, actually, is actually, I guess, creating content that people really want and would link to. And what we found to be most successful is creating content that, like uh, research, so data and statistics, unique data. So we um, poll every year our customers and uh, social media and the wider world to ask them how they're using videos to so our, our 
business. My business is in the explainer video niche, which is a small niche, but definitely booming at the moment with the importance of video. And we ask people how they're using uh, video. So customers uh, from the consumer point of view and businesses from the business point of view, how are they using video and how are things changing year over year? And we get tons of really, really interesting statistics. And these are uh, are linked to by people using those statistics in blog articles and other places as well. And we find that's a, a great way for us to not just generate links, but really uh, authoritative links and also to generate traffic and relationships as well with brands that want to use our, our statistics and data. I, I, I couldn't agree more with you because you mentioned, especially you mentioned this word relation. I think that's right now a very, a very important uh, to, to, to have. Uh, it's more about relation than like just short uh, shortcut. One thing that uh, you reminded me, often I'm receiving this request to participate in um, roundups. Yes. And I'm receiving this from random sources. Obviously, I'm always uh, always trying to give uh, my best answers. That also um, delivers um, some links to my website. And finally, biographies, which have um, been many years ago, I think Point Blank SEO said about this. Um, so, so because I'm speaker at the moment, so every time I am giving my biography, there is a link very often when the, the, the conf- event owner is uploading this on their own website, this link is preserved. So that also leverage um, backlink profile. Fantastic. And so I'd like to just bring this back to uh, your businesses, your, your the ones that you, the brands that you manage, sorry. And I want to ask a simple question, which has probably a big answer, but over your time with these brands, what has been the thing or the few things that you've implemented that have given you outsized results? What's really worked well for you as a business? Um, and is there anything that the listeners could then take away from that? I think um, when we notice that there, there are these new solutions like uh, answer boxes, featured snippets, uh, that I would say that was one of the most important lessons for me because um, as you know how the answer boxes are working, there is no magic trick in HTML. There is no a tag that you can add and magically appear. There is a kind of Google artificial intelligence that is deciding who can be in this answer box and there is only one answer box on on, on the specific keyword. So that make us thinking more about how Google wants us to, to tailor this content and how to maybe use uh, even simpler language you know, for some questions and answers that people will may, may understand this better. So that was one. And, and the other one that was always working very well, it was, um, you know, taking care of all the technical aspects across the whole website. So I am a big fan of uh, deep crawl software that is probably kind of industry standard these days. Mm, and I'm crawling website with passion and uh, you know (laughs) i love crawling websites (laughs) so uh, i'm crawling a lot and what tool are you using for that uh deep crawl okay deep crawl cool yeah deep crawl and uh, yes i think they're doing absolutely amazing uh, amazing job Uh, so so i'm crawling um, website and that gives me a pretty nice view on what's going on with all the technical aspect and all the you know these little bits and bobs that should be fixed. What I really like is to go selectively, so crawling only one part of the web website, um, one section of the website. I'm trying to slice it, and then you know I can have a nice granular view. Uh, so these two things I would say because I don't want to repeat anything what I said before. But uh, but these two things, um, I would say, have been very important for me. Thanks very much. And I guess we've talked a lot about acquisition, SEO particularly, and I'm interested to take that forwards, I guess, then to how do you track the results? What, what are the important metrics that you look for and what tools are you using to track those metrics? So uh, there are right now on the market plenty of tools like SEMrush, like search metrics, like uh, Systrix that can tell a lot about rankings. But I am not that, that big fan of rankings anymore because that is kind of um, not a ev- not whole picture. I rather try to focus on what I see in Google Analytics. Uh, that's my primary source of information. And... Uh, what I'm looking on is very often what I called 
uh, organic traffic and organic non-bounced traffic. And then when you have these two metrics, you can compare them year to year because obviously that makes perfect sense to compare year to year when you have this predictable fluctuation over the year. So imagine when you know what is your non-bounced organic traffic in January 2018, then you can compare this with non-bounced organic traffic in 2017. Uh, so let's go deeper. If you have 100,000 visits when you when you're going straight away without anything like non-bounced bounced anything, you're going to, to to your Google Analytics and you can see that in January 2018 you had let's say 10,000 visits, and in January 2017 you had again 10,000 visits. That looks like there was no growth, but then let's say you and other teams were working hard to make content much better, much more engaging, and so on and so on, and the bounce rate being decreased by 50%, then when you stripe all these bounced visits and you compare once again, you will see amazing uplift. So that would be the one approach. And obviously the other approach is like uh, going granular way per URLs, per traffic source, which predominantly is an SEO, uh, and looking on the factors like a conversion rate, revenue, and conversion volume. And then again, comparing this the previous year, the, the year after the previous year, because uh, that is giving much more context. I'm trying to keep these things quite simple. I remember someone a long time ago, many years ago, told me this rule, which sounds KISS. Keep it stupid simple. <laughs> so, so, or... Simple, stupid. Yeah. You see, I'm trying my best, but <laughs> it's stick somewhere yeah. in my brain, you see. And I'm trying to avoid the word stupid. I'm trying, I was going to keep it super simple. Keep it super simple. I don't want to make... Politically correct. Yeah, I don't want... <laughs> yes, I'm trying not to make anyone feel, you know, um, upset about this. But yeah, I think uh, what gives me a lot of context and what gives me this anchor that I can anchor myself is to compare what was last year and how we look like this year. Obviously, there are also... Uh, forecasts and then and, and, and that's also important and some of the listeners may be a bit upset because they may not have this previous year data i know that's difficult because you cannot anchor yourself anywhere and even if you start you have the first year and then uh, you are in the second year of the website existence then you may see like thousand percent growth because there was pretty much zero in last year and right now we have a couple of thousands so that artificially inflate but for established business, I think, you know, uh, making sure that you're comparing this year to year and, and you know, keeping this simple, uh, going into Google Analytics, uh, not try to overcomplicate because this is another problem of this industry very often or sometimes there are people who are taking so much time into digging in this data, which is great, but that just doesn't change anything um, of the performance. You just have view of where things are, how they look like, and so on and so on. It's like you would be looking on unfinished painting and say, and looking on different part of this unfinished painting. Finally, you need to take a brush and start painting, and then you will finish the painting. Obviously, in our case, you, you don't want to finish this painting. It's like a never-ending story because there is always something to be done, and there is next year and next year and next year. Yeah, absolutely. And there's always another thing to track and improve and improve. And I guess a follow-on question for that would be around funnels. Are you, are you tracking different funnels still? stages and how people might move through the website and in a journey and then are you using that data then if you do track to improve conversion rate at each of those funnel stages to get a greater end result uh, yes absolutely the, the google analytics gives me a lot of insights also external tools like a similar web uh, can help me to understand more about referring traffic, not only for myself, but also for uh, competitors, um, which is also very important information. Finally, you have tools which can uh, visualize all this journey. And I'm thinking right now about tools like Hotjar, which can record session. And that could be also very interesting to see how people are moving between between pages. And we actually also use one called uh, Heap Analytics, which lets us track the funnel stages in a lot of detail as well. It's it's a fantastic tool. Yeah, I, I, I've been uh, working with Heap Analytics the last 
December, I think it's a really fantastic tool, yeah. Okay, so I'd love to take this to our last five questions, which is five quick fire questions. And the first question that I have for you is what's your best piece of marketing advice? The best piece of marketing advice, go your own Kung Fu way. Have your own Kung Fu. Don't try to copy anyone because you are the most important asset in this whole story. The way how you will be dealing with it, uh, must be unique and this is what the success is so obviously don't forget to educate self self educate yourself read a lot uh, try different things but at the end of the day go your own way seo is the perfect example of uh, of it everyone have uh, a little different kung fu and that's the way how people are making this successful fantastic and i guess that's all particularly for small businesses it's all about story as well and that falls in line with that exactly absolutely and can you recommend a book to our listeners? Um, the book, does it need to be from the industry? No, not at all. It's a book that you like, that you'd recommend. Um, it'd be interesting for people to find books from any, any industry, really. So tell us what you like. Well, um, I particularly like everything from Dale Carnegie. That's a motivational books, but they really inspires me because uh, they've been written in before Second World War. And I can see him writing on the typewriter this this books rather than using copy paste from, from some blogs or using some ghost writers. One advice uh, for our listeners, maybe they will find this useful. I'm using audiobooks because that helps me a lot to, you know, when I'm in the crowded underground, I'm using district line every day then in London it would be difficult to have a book. So I'm, I'm always using audiobooks. So Dale Carnegie, uh, there is a couple of really interesting positions. Uh, I won't be specifying because I want everyone to find something for themselves, but uh, they are on Audible. And if you prefer the written version, then probably you will be able to get this from Amazon. Perfect. What's your favorite example of a marketing campaign? You know, I don't have that much um, from the recent time, but every time I'm thinking about the perfect commercial TV, I'm thinking that there was, in 1998, you had this football uh, World Cup in France. And I remember one advert, and I saw this advert only one time, and I couldn't even find this advert in YouTube. So that was when the France become one of the two uh, in, the, in the final, the, they were playing against Brazil. And before this match, there, there was this block of the commercial. And then, you know, they were uh, like a gray, black and white, um, gray scale video of the whole French team holding ball. And they've been dressing with this Adidas dress and they've been doing nothing but saying, everyone was saying, merci. Mercy, and the camera was swiping to the next one, next one, next one, next one. And then finally there was a big logo of Adidas. And I remember my, my reaction when I saw this advert, I was with my, my colleagues, uh, and that was actually in France. We've been that day in France. We just look on each other, it was like, oh my gosh, that was so amazing. Yeah. It had so much um, this emotional impact, you know. It was just a simple word, thank you. And then they won the World Cup, and it was mind-blowing. Yeah, it's unbelievable how advertising can touch you in that way sometimes. So I would do a lot to find this. If any of our listeners remember this advert, please send me a link. <laughs> yeah, put it in the comments. We'd love to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, 1998 uh, French World, World Cup Adidas advert. And what software tool could you not live without? Okay, so now we need probably another 50 minutes. Yeah, well, <laughs> we're talking I have, software. I, yeah. Well, I am very lucky to have a wide spectrum of tools. Uh, I'm, so for keywords research, uh, um, I'm using search metrics, SEMrush, Systrix. Then for links, obviously, Ahrefs and Majestic. Um, for crawling, deep crawl, screaming frog, but also URL profiler. Um, finally, some... I love if this then that for some social media automatization. I really like uh, viral content buzz or uh, or thunderclap. There is no single tool I couldn't live uh, without. I like most specifically this uh, content grader, which is saying how well specific keywords and specific URLs are optimized. 
don't have pretty much one one tool that uh, would cover all uh, and i think this is because the way how i'm working i like to have a lot of different tools i feel like a sergeant you know i have lots of different special tools for special tasks and i know that this is one of the approach because there are some people who are looking for one tool that will cover as much as possible that's absolutely fine i like to have plenty of tools uh, in my workshop work tool I appreciate you going through the, all the different um, examples there. That's very useful for people to certainly check out different ones that you'd recommend for different um, in different areas as well. So that's really cool. Thanks. And which other podcasts do you listen to? I am a big fan of David Bain Digital Marketing Radio. Um, I don't know if you if you had a chance to listen, and uh, obviously. Uh, I'm listening to some American podcasts. One of them, I need to take a look uh, because I forgot the title. Uh, I have this in my podcast list. Per Perpetual Traffic, a podcast and art of paid traffic. And I need to tell you, I have one podcast, which is absolutely unusual podcast. It's Amos Present, the Cranium Session. is a drum and bass podcast when they are playing the new drum and bass releases. And I had the pleasure to be once there with my, my track. Oh. And I'm sometimes, yeah, it's a very unusual uh, approach to have a podcast about drum and bass, but there is a couple of. And then, obviously, I have a couple of friends from Poland who are recording podcasts. There is Margo, who is recording Startup My Life, very interesting podcast. Again, like um, this is in Polish, so whoever is listening to us uh, and speaks Polish, I would recommend Start Up My Life. Excellent. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you very, very much for all your wonderful insights today. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. And I know that the listeners will have got all sorts of different takeaways from today's episode. So thank you very much for taking the time. And I've really enjoyed speaking to you today, Lucas. Thank you very, very much for the invitation. And it was an amazing one hour. And I hope, uh, you know, in the future, uh, we will be in touch. Uh, maybe some other topics we can share um, during that session. If you don't mind, uh, I just wanted to tell people where they can find me online, if that's all right. Please do, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big, big fan of LinkedIn. Uh, on LinkedIn, Lukas, Lukas Zelezny, there is pretty much one. And I have a website, uh, zelezny.uk. Uh, so there are these videos we were mentioning. So if anyone have any questions, uh, suggestions, or would like to say like, no, Lucas, I don't agree with this, then I will be very, very happy to receive some feedback. Absolutely. And I'll put links to uh, everything that you just mentioned there in the show notes on mattbyram.com as well. So if anybody wants to go there and get all the details as well, and um, as well as links to Lucas's website, then you can do that too. Fantastic. Thank you very, very much once again. And it was an amazing one hour. Thanks, Lucas. Take care. Thank you all for listening today. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share with your friends. I'd also be extremely grateful if you could rate and review us on iTunes or the channel you get this podcast through. Next week, I'm joined by Nadia Koja. We discuss content creation, promotion, and ways to hustle as a small marketing team. So until next time, I've been your host, Matt Byron. Matt Byron.